Hi everyone, happy Thursday. Today I want to talk about uh, something that is a common thread or the, the several factors that are a common thread among childhood disorders. And um, I want to be clear before I even begin with this that the these common factors are never about placing blame on mom or dad or whomever. We live in a world that has changed so much in the last 50 years. Um, I was just saying this to my husband the, the other night that in a lot of ways, I think parents are more stressed because we're so aware of, you know, we're trying our best. There's so many things we're aware of now with parenting of what kids need or, you know, what they don't need or whatever. And I think that's where a lot of the guilt plays in because I was, we were talking about helicopter parenting and helicopter parenting, I think, is the result where we are just constantly bombarded with fear and messages of, you know, this can happen to your child and this can happen to your child and so forth. And I said, I think it was easier 20, 30 years ago for parents when they didn't constantly hear about all of these factors. So that being said, let's get into it. Um, you know, if you've tried a lot of the surface level approaches that I've talked about before, like IEPs, medication, tutoring, um, you know, you've gotten the diagnosis and, you know, so many parents are discouraged because their child has a diagnosis and uh, multiple diagnosis and they feel like their, their child is a lemon and they were dealt a really crappy hand. Um, remember, these diagnoses are a cluster of symptoms. There's a reason, there's an imbalance in the body and the brain on a biochemical level and usually on a structural level as well why, in terms of why the brain is not functioning optimally, which is going to result in learning and reading and writing uh, breakdown and behavior breakdown. And when the same networks are affected in the brain, um, you know, then you're going to end up with multiple diagnosis. So we need to address these factors. If you want your child to overcome their learning and behavioral difficulties, you need to address the root cause factors as opposed to managing. So today I'm talking about the root cause factors. I'm talking about the factors that I address in my six month coaching program. And, um, you know, just to give you, it doesn't take six months to see the results. I was just talking with a client a, few, a couple weeks ago who started my program before the holidays and her son who's five or six is, aut is autism spectrum, very bright, but has a lot of difficulties with language and speech and meltdowns and so forth. And just in a few weeks of her doing changes with nutrition and so forth, she said, oh my goodness, we're already seeing a difference in him being able to speak more clearly, him being able to express himself better and his, his like his speech as well being better and less meltdowns. Is it perfect yet? No, because she's just started, but that's pretty amazing results. When we just start chipping away at addressing some of those factors. So factor number one, that is one of the most identified reasons why children, why there's such a rise in learning and behavioral difficulties is poor gut health, gut imbalance. Um, the research has shown that children with ADHD or autism, sorry, specifically autism in these particular studies, had a significantly altered gut bacteria all across the board compared to their neurotypical peers. And similar studies found the same type of stuff with ADHD and so forth. And one, just an example, one bacteria, Clostridia, which uh, is known to be in a very high overgrowth among children with autism spectrum. Once we address that Clostridia overgrowth, as well as yeast and other things, of course, as well, then all of a sudden learning, cognition, reading, behavior, mood, all of that stuff tends to improve. So gut bacteria is influenced by a lot of factors. Um, I've gotten into it before. I won't get into it too much today because it is like I could do a whole course just on that. But I don't want you, again, to go blaming yourself. But factors that can disrupt the gut, gut bacteria are things like antibiotics, chlorinated water, uh, diet high in processed food and sugar. Um, even mom being on contraceptives before, you know, she got pregnant. I was that mom. Um, I had a lot of candida. I passed it on to my daughter as well as other parasites and strep and all kinds of stuff. Um, so... And the more that our gut bacteria becomes disrupted by things like pesticides and hormones and chemicals and the antibiotics that is in our meat or in our dairy products, or we take because they are life-saving. I don't want to say don't take antibiotics. 
um, that's where we're going to see that disruption. And because those antibody or because those bacteria produce so many of our neurotransmitters, yes, the ba gut bacteria does. So like 90% of your serotonin is made by the gut bacteria, then that's going to really affect your child's brain chemistry. And that's just one example. So gut bacteria is huge. There is a second brain in your gut, hundred billion neurons in the gut lining. Number two, the second biggest thing that I look at uh, besides nutrition and gut bacteria and all of that stuff is sensory motor development. Um, so children who have ADHD, autism, all of this type, all these types of disorders on brain scans have brains that are typically three years younger than their peers. So they have an underdeveloped brain. And what happens is these kids might not have crawled or might not have crawled for very long or they miss some other milestone and it doesn't mean it's your fault um yes floor time not having our kids on the floor is a huge factor i said it once and i'll say it a million times my daughter didn't get enough floor time because i was always holding her because she was so darn fussy and i didn't know a whole lot at the time about the importance of floor time and how m the motor skills and movement uh, is what develops the, the the lower brain levels. So if those lower brain levels are not well developed, then the cortex is going to really struggle, which is where the executive functioning and higher brain levels um, or the more high, higher order thinking skills occur. So things like retained primitive reflexes. So I'm not going to go into that today. I have before. You can check out my other videos. But um, if you check out um, that you can check those out on YouTube, but retain primitive reflexes in a nutshell is kind of like your, your child's baby brain. And if that baby brain is still there, then it's going to create an obstruction or a block, uh, for your child to access their higher brain levels. And those can be addressed. That's what's amazing. That's why I do the work I do because I, um, think it's so amazing whenever I started learning that how, how plastic the brain is and the changes that we can, we can do and, and we can see. Um, other factor that, um, I see a lot with kids who have auditory processing disorder, reading difficulties, um, speech impairments, all that type of stuff is chronic ear infections. And I don't want to say chronic. I want to be careful with that because you know what? I've worked with kids who've had just a few ear infections and recently literature came out that even just one ear infection can damage the cilia in the ear that is responsible for, you know, transmitting this, receiving and transmitting the signals elsewhere in the brain and so forth. So if your child's not hearing properly, um, then, and it's not something you can pick up on an, on a standard hearing test because it's not about how the brain, how well the ear is hearing in terms of volume or sound. It's how the brain is processing it and how the information or messages is being transmitted. Um, Next one is food sensitivities. So I often see that. I am not a fan of jumping right into elimination diets. The first pillar of my program is nourishment, not elimination. Uh, we wanna make sure that if we have fussy eaters or kids who are nutrient de deficient, we're not pulling out more food that is typically healthy, but could be an irritation. We work on that later. But uh, dairy is a huge factor, as well as things like gluten, possibly eggs, soy, corn, all that type of stuff. And again, I'm not a one size fits all. I'm not saying all kids that struggle should be on a gluten or dairy free diet. It really depends. And it depends on the quality as well. But uh, sensitivities have been definitely linked in the research to um, brain inflammation inflammation in the gut obviously as well and causing all sorts of other problems with processing. I actually have kids who we pull them off dairy and their reading and speech improve significantly. All of that mucus can cause a lot of problems with how the, the ear is hearing and so forth, especially if they have that sensitivity. Um, deficiencies. So the first pillar of my program is working on nourishment. That is huge. And so many of our kids have deficiencies. Um, sometimes it's genetic. It doesn't mean you're a bad mom. You could have, I could have three uh, kids in a family and only one of them is having, has a deficiencies and has all these learning difficulties. Sometimes it's the way they metabolize things because of their genetics, which we can address. And sometimes it's because of their gut health, because they're not absorbing things well, because their gut is a mess. So um, looking into deficiencies is definitely uh, really important. And one of the kind of first places I start to start leveling things off. 
Um, I'm not going to go into genetic mutations too much, but uh, the CM COMT and the MTHFR gene are huge. If you have a child with autism and if you've done any research, you've probably come across that. Um, my daughter has two mutations with that. She's a 50% reduced ability to detoxify. Uh, and as many of you know, she used to have all kinds of pretty serious struggles. She had a very serious uh, autoimmune, uh, neuro autoimmune condition. Not anymore. So those gene mutations don't mean do not mean it's permanent, but it makes them can make them vulnerable, especially in an environment that is toxic, where we eat a lot of synthetic food and we're exposed to a lot of chemicals and heavy metals and all of that type of stuff. And, you know, autoimmune dis diseases being on the rise that can make your child more vulnerable. But there are things that we can do to make your child's brain and body and nervous system more resilient. And keep in mind with ge with genes that just because your child or yourself or a family member carries a gene, it does not mean that gene is on. This is the field of epigenetics. All that it means is that that gene um, is there and different lifestyle factors can decide if that gene is going to express or not express. And even if a gene is expressed, we can do things to tone down that gene and, to, and, and for it to literally turn off. And I'm pretty confident we've done that with my daughter because we're at a point now where she doesn't have to be on an insanely strict diet. Uh, she is like a lot of other kids, we eat healthy, but she can eat pizza with her friends every now and then and she doesn't go into a major flare and we don't have all kinds of problems because we've worked so much on her gut health and other lifestyle factors. So I don't know if she really still does have a 50% reduced ability to toxify. Maybe that gene has just gone dormant, uh, you know, hopefully and thankfully if it has. Um, another factor, and again, no mom guilt allowed, but just to make you aware of that um, role, even for the future, hormonal contraceptives. There's a huge link between a much higher rate of autism spectrum and hormonal contraceptives and hormonal contraceptives. Um, and they're finding that with other childhood disorders as well as a lot of other stuff, right? Even just w women's health and cancer and all kinds of stuff. Um, so what happens is that the child's brain, the woman still has those hormones in her. She might not be detoxifying them very well on top of that. And then that child's brain development is being affected by that hormonal exposure. And keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that um, that hormonal exposure is not just from contraceptives. If we're drinking city water, especially if we don't have any kind of filtration system like the Berkey or reverse osmosis, our children and ourselves are ingesting hormonal contraceptives. They found that the drinking water contains disturbingly high levels of estrogen or xenoestrogens, which is going to affect our children's body and brain development. So you, you might have already heard about, you know, four-year-olds who are hitting puberty. That's not uh, something that happened in the past in the way that it's happening now, and it's exposure to xenoestrogens and so forth. So <laughs> with all of that in mind, what do you do? Number one, this is my recommendation for you today, is to start with eating clean uh, and, and you don't have to do it all overnight. No need to do any crazy January resolutions. If, try to think of what is probably the most toxic thing in my child's world. If you think that toxicity is an issue, if you think that something is really disrupting their gut health, what can I eliminate that can help make a difference? And even if you do that slowly, that's what we do in my program. Um, some parents are ready to go all, you know, full on because they've been working on it for a while and other parents are kind of new to this. And that's why it's a six month program to help weave those changes in, to not make it into a, you know, parenting battle or World War III, to ch make those changes so that kids will buy into it, particularly if they're a little bit older. And so that mom and dad can keep their head above water so they're not overwhelmed and feel like they're taking on a second career by learning how to do all of this and to implement it. So, <clears throat> Just start with that, build nourishment, focus on really healthy foods that you can start adding in, stuff like le dark leafy greens, good quality protein, berries, um, more, you know, high, high quality veggies as opposed to just like, you know, potatoes and so forth. And not that those are bad, but, you know, if we, we want to add in more colorful fruits and veggies and um, working our way from there. So let me know in the comments below whether you're watching the live or the replay, does your child, do you think that any of these factors 
are um, a factor with your child? Do you think that any of these factors might have influenced their brain development, how their brain is working and so forth? And have you actually, maybe I know that some of you have already started addressing some of these. Let me know how or what you have started addressing. So thanks for watching everyone. Don't forget to grab my free starter kit, the laser focused learner. I will pop that in the comments below so that you can grab that and get some exercises and tips with nutrition on where to start first to start addressing the root cause of these factors so that your child can get past the limitations of IEPs, medication, and endless tutoring. Thanks for watching.